And uh, welcome to good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, secure this secure coding tutorial. Uh, how exploitable is insecure C code? Uh, my name is David Sabota. I'll be your host. I will <laughs> or a tutor for this tutorial. Uh, I think what I'll do is first of all, uh, there are a handful of exercises in this tutorial and I hope to give everyone a chance to do those exercises. But uh, we'll have some background slides first before the exercises start. So um, I will say that if you have not followed the instructions uh, here, uh, about downloading and setting up the tutorial exercises, uh, you'll want to do that uh, immediately. I think what I'm going to do is uh, I will is if people have questions, I'll actually ask you to to speak the questions over over zoom uh, and I'll ask for questions at the uh, end of each slide. Well, I see one chat question. Okay, that's not a question. But yes, uh, thank you, Miles. Uh, he's posted the location for where to download these, uh, where to download the material. So uh, um, there'll be a good bit of lecture before the first slide. If you have to start downloading now, then go ahead and start. And hopefully uh, your virtual machine will be ready before we actually begin the first exercise. Okay, so I'm going to start off by a background of software security. Uh, so uh, I suspect most people who are attending SecDev will already know this, but ultimately software is slowly eating the world. It is at least, uh, you know, driving much of the, uh, well, a lot of America's economy at this point. Uh, it's pri it primarily, um, and uh, with software being everywhere, software vulnerabilities are everywhere too. I have yet to find a major piece of software that has no vulnerabilities, although I have found some that have much less than usual. So uh, software vulnerabilities generally occur everywhere and uh, they can jeopardize everything that uh, depends on, on software, like your personal identity, your intellectual property, uh, you know, HIPAA information, HIPAA information uh, for, uh, for, for health uh, reasons here. Um, and of course our critical infrastructure. So when we speak of software security, then uh, we're speaking of something quite different than security software. Security software is software written for the purpose of improving security, such as that uh, login and password field, such as uh, encryption, such as, as firewalls and uh, so on. So uh, of course software security, well, Software security is important for security software, but it's important for all software because usually the uh, well, usually the way to to uh, exploit some software is not through the front door, the main place that the security has been put in place, but it's mainly to but the best way to exploit software is through the back door, through some channel that was not considered to be secure. And so software security is basically about engineering software so that it continues to function while under attack. So we are trying to improve the resilience of software uh, and trying to improve the, uh, well, trying to re reduce or eliminate the number of bugs that occurs. The good news is that making software secure and making software bug free are both very closely aligned. Uh, there's very little that you can do that improves one without improving the other. However, there's lots of ways of fixing bugs in software that don't improve security and it's certainly possible for software.
that is insecure and uh, vulnerable to, to appear to work perfectly fine when given normal input. Um, so ultimately, software is insecure and imperfect because it's written by human beings. Uh, human beings often, you know, are not aware of all the interactions that their software might have with their with the software's ecosystem. It can also occur from from developers not thinking like an attacker and assuming that their program will only have to handle um, um, benign input. Uh, it, they may not have to. They may not consider what happens when particularly malicious or unexpected input comes in, well, because it's unexpected. So the photo on the left has actually been really popular in the security circles for a long time. And it does an excellent job of illustrating uh, my earlier point that people often uh, don't try and and thwart the main don't try and defeat the main uh, axis of security but instead they try and route around it one interesting story about this photo is that uh, we first encountered it in the uh, late 2000s around 2008 or so and we had no idea where it actually came from until about 10 years ago when we when it was discovered that it was actually from a hospital in belfield germany and we therefore managed to snag the photo on the right. And the photo on the right, uh, which shows the same building, uh, well, from the other viewpoint, but also shows how the uh, security problem was actually fixed. So on the left, you can see the security control, a simple roadblock, and you can see clearly how the security was bypassed without the security control ever being tampered with. And on the right picture, you can see how the uh, security was actually fixed. <laughs> a whole bunch of studs in the road pretty much prevented the exploit that was that was happening. Okay, so um, I'm not quite sure why, but every time I present this, uh, unless I'm speaking to a bunch of C programmers, people wonder, you know, why, why are we dealing with C? Isn't C kind of an old uh, language? Uh, and, you know, most projects, they are not being written in C. So first of all, I'll admit I'm doing a lot of research in AI and ML, and we're mostly using Python there. And I'm doing some web apps, which uh, don't involve C. But the simple fact is that the computer I'm doing all this stuff on is uh is has its kernel uh written in c this is a mac and if it was a windows machine that kernel is also written in c and your linux kernel is also written in c and you can also pull out your smartphone and i'm willing to bet that that kernel is also written in c as well as some of the applications so c is still at the heart of our computing infrastructure and uh, uh, most of the embedded devices in your life, uh, including your car, will also have C code running running inside them. So uh, this is mainly, I'll, I'll talk more about this, but uh, C is still at the heart of our critical infrastructure. And while you may, you may prefer not to use it for new projects, there is a tremendous amount of C code already, already uh, existing out there and uh, so it, vulnerabilities in that C code can can <laughs> get you hacked. OK, so a quick background on C it was created in the early 70s. It is actually uh, it's actually close to 50 years old. Its 50th birthday will be, I think, next year. Um, the first book on C, the uh, C programming language by Brian Carnegie and Dennis Ritchie was published in 1979 or eight actually and c has actually been standardized for since 1983 uh the committee to maintain the c standard is this iso committee on the bottom um uh, wg14 uh, wg just stands for working group uh they're a small group of about 25 people uh people representing 25 companies and uh you know seven to nine countries uh that come every every year for the standard meetings um, if you want to extend the language, then you submit a proposal to WG14, and they will discuss it, 
And most likely they'll, they'll say, well, this could be good, but you need to fix this, this, and this, and this. Um, and then, you know, if you, if you do this back and forth for, after, for two or three years, then maybe it will get accepted. Okay, uh, C++, I bring this up because uh, C++ is close enough to C that we often cover it in our, uh, in our C tutorials. Uh, it's a fairly, it's a newer language, uh, first created in 1983 by Bjarne Stromstrup, uh, and it also has a standards committee, uh, Working Group 21, that maintains the standard C++ edition. So I've seen a lot of C++ code, and frankly, most of the C++ code that I see in production is actually C code with almost no changes. It, it's almost completely compatible with C. Uh, and then a, a large subgroup of the remainder is C that has a couple of objects in it. So, uh, so basically C still uh, is still very evident in C++. And if the current C++ code for new projects will have a lot of syntactic differences uh, and features not in C. There are, of course, many other languages. I'll, I'll just go over two quick ones. Uh, Java is, by some metrics, the most popular language today. It's often used for, um, for business applications or web applications. Uh, I'll address the popularity of Java related to C in a little bit. Uh, C does correct many of the problems that, uh, sorry, Java corrects many of the problems with C. Um, However, uh, such as uh, memory safety issues. However, it's still susceptible to various security problems. We're not going to go over them now. But the most important thing is that Java includes a large runtime library, and that makes it really unsuitable for running on, um, well, on bare wires. You're not going to find Java code in your automobile or in your internet accessible toaster. Um, so you're only going to find it in, uh, well, usually on larger machines, including you know, your, your desktop or your web server. So one of the newer languages to come out uh, called Rust is a language uh, that's designed to provide the same kind of memory safety that Java provides. But unlike Java, it doesn't use garbage collection and it, uh, it's suitable for embedded development. And by that, I mean, you can, you could, you know, add some Rust code to your car because it does not require an operating system or a library, a standard library to accompany it. Uh, the goal is for Rust to be as efficient and portable as idiomatic C++ without sacrificing safety. The only, the only real problem I can say with Rust is simply that it's so new that it has, I have not seen much embedded code uh, using Rust yet, but it's still young We'll just have to wait and see. So this next slide I have shows simply the various popularity of programming languages according to the TOB index. Uh, TOB is a website that that mainly surveys the popularity of programming languages. They've been at it for uh, about 25 to 30 years. The graph I'm showing you goes back to 2000. C is the dark blue. Uh, is the dark blue curve here, and as you can see, it's been number, it's been tussling with Java for the number one spot for 20 years. Actually, something interesting has happened now in that Python, uh, the green spot, has now is now about neck and neck with C and Java. But the main point I want to bring out here is that C is still one of the most prominent languages uh, and will continue to be prominent for a long time to come. And the reason is better shown in this next, uh, uh, in these next survey results. This is the bar group embedded survey, which shows the prominence of programming languages restricted to the embedded world. And in the embedded world, as you can see, C controls 70% of the code that's out there with a 20% going to C++ and then about 6% going to other languages, uh, including Java. But the point is, C is not only the most popular here, it dominates the, uh, the field. You are going to have a hard time selling any uh, embedded software written in a different language. I'm not saying it's impossible, just saying it's, it's hard. And this is where C 
still shines and still rules the world of embedded software. And that includes, you know, operating systems and the like. So, of course, C has lots of problems. It's, you know, almost 50 years old. Um, uh, and for many years, the, uh, uh, the Software Engineering Institute's CERT Coordination Center uh, collected vulnerabilities. Uh, that net job has now been taken over by MITRE CVEs. Uh, but the bulk of our of our the vulnerabilities that we used to collect were written in C. And again, these uh, vulnerabilities arise from a imprecise understanding of the semantics of how of how uh, C works. Um, as I said, the C is useful as a lightweight language. You can put a C program that relies on nothing, you know, no standard library. You can put such a program on bare metal on, say, a car's uh, electronic control module and C was also designed to be fast and take advantage of the performance options that your hardware provides. So C is always taking the attitude that, you know, the programmer knows what they're doing. They understand the details of the hardware. They understand the details of their compiler and precisely what their compiler will produce given a source program. Unfortunately, that knowledge, uh, well, a lot of programmers will not have that knowledge. So every language has to deal with, you know, programmers who don't who don't know what they're doing. And the way that C handles it is, um, well, mostly historical to to, you know, because it's C is primarily governed by the standard group uh, WG14 and the uh, and the ISO C standards that have been published with the last one being published in 2017. Uh, so, actually, I'm going to skip this slide because undefined behavior, the one I want to point out, is actually covered more on the next slide. Undefined behavior is simply a way of, for the C standards committee to, to say, um, your program is erroneous. We, uh, we allow the compiler to do anything it wants to if your program does something. If your program, for instance, uh, creates an array of 10 items and then tries to access the 11th item that, in that 10 item array, the behavior is undefined, which means that it's that which means the standard is not going to impose anything on what the compiler or the hardware does with your program. The hardware is free to do anything. It's free to give you an eleventh item. It's free to give you what happens to be in memory where that eleventh item would be if it existed. It's free to stop your program completely, um, and it's free to play the game of life. There is no constraint whatsoever made on the compiler. So uh, this slide basically uh, lists a lot of text from the C standard about what undefined behavior is. And, uh, and uh, so the main point is that just about all, not all, but most of your vulnerabilities uh, are covered by undefined behavior. Places where your program did something erroneous and the compiler may have done something, well, they might just have let the program continue as it is and do that erroneous thing in the object code. And that can create lots of problems as far as security goes. Um, are there any questions so far? I know I've kind of zipped through things. Okay, uh, not seeing any, I will, I will move on. Um, so there are, of course, hang on. There are, of course, many. Uh, there we are. Got lost a moment. There are many coding standards and books about how to use C. And as you might guess, our favorite at the SCI is the CERT C Secure Coding Standard. Um, this actually has been developed on a uh, on a wiki since the mid two thousands, um, and it has actually been published in. Uh, well, three versions, uh, version one in 2008. The latest version that was published was in a PDF that's available freely, uh, published in 2016. And the link at the bottom here shows the current location of the, uh, of the rules and recommendations of the CERT-C coding standard. The standard is useful for you to, in order to avoid uh, vulnerabilities and defects in your C code. Uh, the standard itself is made of rules and recommendations. 
And this is actually very similar to other coding standards such as MISRA, uh, where uh, violating a rule is uh, likely to result in a defect that can, uh, uh, well, that can affect the program security. The rules and recommendations do not rely on the source code. You can't, add, you can't, you know, make a code comply with the rule by just adding a uh, comment that's saying, please let this compile. Uh, and uh, you can determine whether the code violates, uh, complies with the standard easily through various analysis tools or, or manual code inspection. And uh, there's also a bunch of recommendations, which are uh, recommendations are sort of rules that aren't fully baked yet. They are, they are good ideas, but uh, violating them do not necessarily make your code insecure. Uh, for instance, using a, con a consistent indentation style uh, makes your code more readable, but it does not necessarily make your code more secure. Uh, in addition to the rules and recommendations, the SCI offers a course in uh, secure coding and C and C++. This could be a four-day course, uh, you know, that's uh, delivered actually at your school or company. It's also available online at the uh, at the link below at the bottom of the slide. And we we the course assumes that you have a basic knowledge of C. Uh, that's a little unlike this tutorial where we're assuming that you don't know C. Uh, we assume for the course that you you know can write can code your way out of a paper bag. Um, but we discover discuss the more advanced aspects of C that can make secure coding uh, difficult and uh, well fraught with peril. We're going to cover some of these things today, such as um, such as string management and formatted output. Uh, but the objectives of the training is to at least show you, you know, how easy it is to uh, to write insecure code and how easy that insecure code is to exploit. So uh, we'll give what we're giving you today. Uh, what I'm teaching you today is a little bit of material from the course. All right. Uh, are there any questions before I dive into uh, the first part of secure coding? Okay, so um, the first we'll start with is the buffer overflow. In order to understand buffer overflows, you have to understand how strings are stored. A string, of course, is any sequence of characters. It could be your password, it could be your name, or your social security number for Americans. Um, but any data that can be represented textually in any language actually will generally be stored as a string. Um, in addition to in addition to you know strings used in the real world, there's plenty of strings used in in programming, such as uh, well command line arguments, um, and strings are used in just about every language, but they are a bit more primitive in C than in other languages like Python. So in C, of course, a string is basically an a sequence or an array of characters. For example, I have here a string that is that actually occupies six characters or bytes, even though the length of the string, the number of characters, is uh, five. So one easy source of vulnerabilities is this is this uh, null terminator here, which C uses to indicate that the string uh, ends there. That's a that it is a uh, I guess you call it a delimiter. Uh, so every in C, every string ends with a terminating null character. And so what I'm trying to say is that one of the sources of problems is that the number of bytes required by this string is, in this case, one more than the actual number of characters in the string. So it's easy to create an off by one error if you only allocate enough space to hold the characters of the string without including that you need to hold a byte for the null terminating character. So here's another example of how C is rather primitive and um, not designed for security. So C, along with most other languages, have has the notion of a string literal, simply a sequence of zero of zero more characters uh, that can be used to represent itself. Uh, in particular, 
In C++, the type of a string literal is const char. Const char simply means that it simply means that the set of characters cannot be changed. But in C, it's declared as plain char, uh, an array of plain char, not const. This means that C lets you change the contents of a constant string. However, um, however, doing this is officially undefined behavior, and we forbid it in the cert secure coding rule STR 30-C. <laughs> so one question that arises is why not just change the standard so that uh, so that string literals are const char in C just like they are in C++. When I first joined WG14, that was my first question. I proposed, you know, why don't we make this const chart of what and close this set of potential vulnerabilities? And well, the answer is that doing that would break old code, and the committee must never break old code. The reasoning is that C is a is while being 50 years old, C is uh, one of the most successful languages. And there's that success is partially built on the fact that they never break old code. And for that reason, old warts in the design, such as that a string literal is non constant, uh, continue to exist and code that relies on such things continues to compile and run. So uh, in this slide, uh, I simply list a bunch of string manipulation errors. Um, such as uh, uh, null termination errors. You know, if that if that null byte goes missing, then lots of bad things can happen. Uh, but the big problem is reading and writing outside of the bounds of the array holding the string. Uh, and I'll come to improper data standardization separately because that's an important point, but it's actually distinct from buffer overflows. So, so. Uh, Let's go right into buffer overflows. A buffer overflow usually occurs during a string copy operation. A string is being copied from one location to another. And in particular, a source string is being copied from one location to another location where the destination simply does not have the uh, bytes sufficient to hold the source string. And consequently, um, uh, consequently, the buffer overflows, or rather the string overflows the buffer and overwrites other memory. What is in that memory is depends upon the memory layout of the program, and so it's incredibly hard to predict. And so for that reason, we usually just say a buffer overflow is a bug in itself and can overwrite some critical memory. <coughs> So here's one other item uh, that should scare you. The first paper to actually discuss the uh, the nature of buffer overflows was this paper at the bottom called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit, published in 1996. However, the first uh, exploit or the first widely known exploit that uh, took advantage of a buffer overflow actually was uh, the Morris worm. Uh, how many people here remember the Morris worm? It took down about 10% of the internet in uh, the fall of 1988. Now think about that. In 1988, Robert, uh, yeah, Robert T. Morris was able to exploit buffer overflows uh, and cause this worm, but it, was to, it wasn't until eight more years that the, uh, the technique that he was using actually became publicly available. So for a long time, buffer overflows were actually the biggest source of vulnerabilities. I believe today they have been surpassed by SQL injection and web-based problems like cross-site scripting. And one of the big problems of buffer overflows is that since they overwrite uh, memory that doesn't belong to the string, they can be used to modify internal data or direct the program to execute um, malware. So for example, here's a very simple program where uh, where all we're doing is, is uh, this program takes three or takes two arguments. Uh, by convention, the argv parameter will take command line arguments. So you would call this program with 
you know, um, someone like Fu and Barr, where Fu is the RV1 and Barr is RV2. And this uh, program would simply take a buffer of 2,048 characters and put in that buffer something like Fu equals Barr. So the question then becomes, which line on this code can create uh, can create a buffer overflow. So I'll give you a minute to uh, ponder this before going to the uh, before moving on to the answer. Okay. Um, so first of all, the uh, there's no restrictions placed on the, the length of RV1 or RV2. That means RV1 could be greater than 2048. And so the first line, the first call to string copy could overflow. Likewise, RV2 could be greater than 2048. Uh, and therefore the third line could also overflow. But if RV1 was say 2047 characters, then the first line would not overflow, but the second line, which copies just three characters, would. So in other words, all three lines uh, after the uh, after the name declaration, all three lines, each of them could overflow the buffer. I mean, only one will at a time at each invocation, but if you run this program three times, you can easily have each line uh, overflow the buffer. All right. Um, I'm going to just go over this really quickly because the getS function was a notorious example of buffer overflow capabilities. It was added to the C standard in, uh, well, in its very first invocation by the ANSI committee in 1984. And in particular, the getS function is defined to receive input from the user uh, and stop only when the user either closes the input or hits a new hits the new line character. And as you can see, this code faithfully um, faithfully complies with that algorithm. It, it continues filling the buffer with characters until a new line or end of file uh, occurs. And afterwards, it adds a terminating null character to the string and returns it. What is missing from this code is any notion of how much capacity the dest buffer actually has. And so not only does buffer overflow become possible and easy with this function, but it's actually impossible to prevent the user from overflowing a buffer. And because of this, the getUs function uh, has actually been deprecated and removed from standard C. It was removed in the uh, C11 in 2011. Uh, uh, most compilers today will happily let you compile code that uses getUs, although they will give you dire warnings should you dare to do such a foolhardy thing. It's certainly useful if you want to show just how insecure C can be. Um, finally, I'm going to point out that simply uh, the program stack contains a lot of data on it, uh, including uh, stack return values. If you have a program main which calls A and then A calls B and then B, your inside program B, then you have a memory layout that uh, matches what you have in the slide. And if you overflow a buffer in, say, a string that's declared in B, you can overwrite the part of the stack frame for B and part of the stack frame for A and part of the stack frame for main. The catch here is that these stack frames will contain uh, addresses for the program to jump to when you know it's done. Yeah, you know, when the program has to keep track of uh, what happens when it's finished executing B, you know, it returns to the end of A. And if you can overwrite that return value, you can direct the program to execute malware. Um, so this is why buffer overflows are so dangerous because it's because people have known how to how to uh, execute what we call a stack smashing attack by uh, overriding stack functions and directing the program to execute malware. They've known how to do this since 1988. And uh, um, uh, there are technologies to mitigate this, but now the mitigations are foolproof. And the only foolproof way to prevent buffer overflows is to 
make sure that your strings have enough <coughs> that you, the destination arrays in which, which you copy strings have enough space to hold whatever string you're, you're using. Um, okay, so I'm going to move past this, and it's time to, to do our first exercise. So the exercise, I'm going to move, I'm going to first give you a demo of how the exercise works. So uh, you all should be seeing a uh, Eclipse screen and a program. Uh, I'm going to just scroll up a little bit. As you can see, the program just simply, uh, it contains some secret text up here, but all the program does is it asks you for your name and uh, and once you type it in, it says welcome and, and gives your name. So I'll run the program once just to show you how it works there. And it says, welcome, David, and it ends. Very simple. Uh, and you're not going to have to change this program. Uh, I don't mind if you do, but uh, the point of this is to test the program and to see just how insecure it can be. I'm going to run the program in the debugger now just to show you how that's done and show you, to give you a good idea of what the program, how the program is put together. So if we go to uh, uh, debug uh, history and select name, then uh, the, pro the window changes a little bit, but uh, what we have now, I'm gonna move this up just a little bit. What we have now is simply the programs, it, the computer is single stepping through each line. So the first line creates the secret, uh, these next two lines allocate space for the user string and the output string. And as you can see, the user string and the output string both live up here. They're both empty, but they both have a capacity. The user has a malloc of limit, which is 50. So you can have 50 characters in user or 50 bytes. And output has a, uh, has a limit of, uh, of 100, 2 times 50. The next thing the program does is it prints, please enter your name. And now we uh, get the name from the user. And I'll again, apply and enter David. So now at this point, both, um, well, the, the user string is now uh, David, but the output string, it, it says it's empty here, but that's something of a lie because the output string is completely uninitialized. So this line puts a null terminating character in the very first byte, which makes output look like an empty string. So I'm going to move on. So now we copy the word welcome to the output. And as you can see in the upper right, output gets the word welcome. And now and then it gets the word David. And then this output is printed to uh, um, to the console. It actually doesn't show up in the console yet because I didn't add any new line to it, but uh, you've already seen that I ran it and it and it did. So, so this is how the program <clears throat> is supposed to work under normal circumstances. The exercise that you're supposed to do, and I will give you 10 minutes to do this exercise, um, is two things. First of all, can you make the program crash or terminate by overflowing the input buffer. And the second is, can you actually put a cause a buffer overflow without crashing the program? That is, can you give some input that overflows the buffer, but does not crash the program where the program prints, you know, welcome and terminates normally? Uh, so uh, I will give you 10 minutes to do this exercise and uh, we'll handle questions.
You have one minute left. All right, well, I will show you how to do both of these things. Uh, the first, to create, to create a buffer overflow, uh, I will run the program. And since the uh, item has to be, since the string uh, for output, for both user and output, have to be 50 characters, all I need is 50 characters in here. So I will type 50 in. That's 10, 20, So now I'll just type my own name in, and this time it terminates. Uh, what happened here is that the uh, standard C library detected that uh, uh, detected that I had somehow corrupted memory, and uh, therefore uh, this is a way of crashing the program. Uh, the second way of uh, the second exercise question was to give a buffer overflow which does not crash the program. And uh, the first time I tried this, uh, in fact, this string did not crash the program at all. It, uh, it still said hello uh, with that number and then David, but uh, I can still, uh, so I have to be a bit more careful with the, this buffer overflow. So this time I'm gonna type 51 characters. So 110, 20, 50, 51. Actually, 52 because of the terminating uh, null character. And this program works correctly, even though I indeed overflowed the buffer. So this is the nature of undefined behavior. While the program can crash and it can be used to hack someone, the program can also work perfectly fine when given certain benign inputs. Again, the compiler imposes no uh, no constraints on sorry the standard imposes no constraints on what the compiler may do okay so moving on um memory safety is a fundamental problem uh because c achieves great performance without by sacrificing memory safety buffer overflows to to happen so it's actually a heavy price you pay for the speed of working in C. Of course, uh, buffer overflows are not the only problem you have. Uh, for those who may remember the heartbeat vulnerability, this is a vulnerability caused by something that wasn't a buffer overflow, but was very similar. It was actually what we call an out of bounds read. It, uh, it basically allowed uh, people to ex exfiltrate information from a web server uh, where the information was basically memory loud. It could have been sensitive information like passwords or credit card numbers. And one other catch with Heartbleed was that there was no way of knowing if a program ever suffered if someone did an exploit because the program does not crash. It, it leaked sensitive memory and then happily continued running on its merry way. So this is the code in OpenSSL that was vulnerable to Heartbleed. And as you might guess, this code had been in production for several years. Uh, the code works perfectly fine. Uh, and the, the uh, vulnerable part was with the payload variable, this uh, int right here. I've highlighted it throughout the code. The payload value gets, uh, is declared here. Uh, it gets data from the network 
the data that comes from the network includes a payload and um, the, the rules, uh, I believe this is an RFID, the, the rules simply said that this is a heartbeat protocol, which simply says, you know, give me some memory here and, and the payload says how many bytes the memory should take. So uh, this uh, macro uh, N to S actually initializes payload with number of bytes to fill it with and the program therefore proceeds to to allocate space to hold the payload plus some overhead and then it copies uh, using the mem copy function at the bottom here it mem copies data from its internal data structures to payload and as you as you can see down here there's no check to see that payload is actually a valid value the attacker could have said you know give me the time of day and take and you know spend two bytes giving me that information uh, and that's about how long how much a time t variable takes it could also say give me the time of day however it takes 60,000 bytes to give us that information in which case the mem copy would happily read beyond the time of day and read the next 60,000 bytes put them into into the bp and send it out to the out, out to the user and this is how the uh, how sensitive memory could have been leaked as you might guess this was fixed pretty easily just simply by adding some validation to payload. In particular, down here, if one plus two plus payload plus sixteen is greater than a uh, the length of the um, of the buffer that was being read, then the the system silently discarded. It it realized that this would be a malicious packet and it ignored it. So as you can see, memory safety and the lack of memory safety in C can lead to buffer overflows <clears throat> and can lead to information disclosure as was demonstrated by Heartbleed. So uh, memory safety is guaranteed by many newer languages, but they all do so at the cost of performance and at the cost of expensive uh, uh, safety checks. Uh, Rust is an interesting candidate because it promises it promises memory safety without the uh, performance sacrifice that you get in Java. So that's why Rust might be suitable for embedded programming. Only time will tell. Okay, so Valgrind. Valgrind is the first salvo in trying to give C memory safety. It is a dynamic analysis tool that runs on uh, Linux, on both 32 and 64 bit Linux, which uh, it basically is a framework that executes Intel in assembly instructions and allows people to add tools to it to detect things. Uh, the most common tool is called memcheck, and memcheck detects buffer overflows. It also detects uh, um, using uninitialized values, and it detects uh, invalid freeing of memory and memory leaks. Uh, there's some things it doesn't do. It doesn't do bounce checking on static arrays um but that's okay well there's other tools that handle that so for instance this program has two problems with it it first allocates a space for 10 elements uh, to stick in this uh, pointer x and then it asks for well it looks like the 10th element but one of the catches of c is that the first element is array index zero so x sub 10 is actually the 11th element of the array. It tries to write 0 into the 11th element, and that is outside the bounds of memory. This means that when you run memcheck uh, and valgrind on this code, you will see this uh, invalid write of size 4. Um, it also gives you the, uh, well, it gives you a stack trace of what that happened. It also gives you a stack trace of where the memory was allocated, which was on the line above. And there's a second problem with this code, and that is simply the uh, the memory that is allocated here is never actually freed, uh, causing a memory leak, and therefore Valgren detects the memory leak. So, so you can use Valgren to catch buffer overflows and other memory problems, and that is going to be your next exercise. So I will first go back to the uh, virtual machine and show you how to run Valgrind on this code. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to run it on uh, normal benign code input. And as you can see, 
while Valgrind is running, it doesn't actually report any problems because the code itself is perfectly fine. So I'm going to uh, tweak the code. You're free to do this yourself. You don't have to. And now I have just uh, I've just removed one of the freeze. So when I run this under Valgrind again, uh, it's been modified. Yes, I want to save changes. So once again, uh, the program terminates, but if we go over to Valgrid now, uh, we see that uh, we see a memory leak. This call to malloc over here never actually got free because I commented out the free. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uncomment it back, and I will turn over to your exercise again. Two questions. First of all, can Valgrind catch a buffer overflow? So just give this program a buffer overflow and see if Valgrind detects that it happened. And the second question is, can you overflow the buffer without Valgrind detecting it? Uh, try entering a buffer overflow that Valgrind does not catch. Uh, again, I will give you 10 minutes to try this exercise. So um, good luck.
One minute. All right, everyone. Um, so uh, to show you the and my answer to this exercise, I will again launch my virtual machine and run, or I will run use Valgrin to, uh, and this time I'll give it the the same uh, light buffer overflow I gave while well, typing fifty one characters. Only. I'm just doing an X. So in that case, the program uh, the program ran. It completed normally, but Valgren still detected it. In particular, it detected just a one byte buffer overflow, even though that that uh, problem did not cause the program to crash. And you'll notice that the, that several lines of code uh, lit up because of that. Uh, the buffer overflow first occurs on line eleven. Uh, where get us, you know, lets it overflow, and then that uh, actually went over here to, to line 14 because the bad data went into output. Uh, line eight got highlighted simply because uh, there's nothing wrong with that line, but that was where the overflow buffer was allocated. Uh, my conclusion from this is that Valgren can catch buffer overflows, and I do not know how to overflow the buffer without Valgren detecting it. So this is my way of saying that the second question is no. I'm not certain it's no, but I have no idea how to do it. If you figure it out, please let me know. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, I'm going to talk quickly about injections. I know several others uh, have, have mentioned them. Here, but ultimately, uh, an injection is a failure of validation and sanitization. So, validation is pretty well known. It's the it's the process of, of making sure that input that you get from a user falls within the intended domain of the uh, of the receiver. So, we have several examples of validation here. Uh, the best, you know, probably the most common example today is simply making sure that a username and password is uh, represents a valid user, um, but of course, uh, any any kind of input can be validated if you if you have at all any concern about what the input might be. A sanitization is just as critical as validation and is nowhere near as well known. The process of sanitization is ensuring that data conforms to the requirements of the subsystem to which it is passed. Uh, oftentimes, strings will be passed to various subsystems where the subsystem expects a string to follow some particular syntax. And if the string does not follow that syntax, then there might be a system error, a syntax error, or the or malicious string can can use the subsystem to run arbitrary code. The code may not be completely arbitrary, but it can do things that was not intended to be done by the main program. Um, so there are many. So here's an example uh, of uh, data sanitization where a program wishes to send some mail to a uh, to a user and it needs an, an email address from from the user. Uh, so 
the argument is that you have, you have a program called bin slash mail, which takes an address and takes a mail to send. The address is given, to, uh, the address state comes from the user, uh, where the user can give any address it wants. And, uh, and then this command is sent to the, uh, to the system function, which invokes it as if it is a shell command. So um, while this program will work perfectly fine if the user provides a valid email address, if they provide a malicious email address such as this one, uh, then the program will first send mail to bogus at adder.com, but it will, it will next take the Etsy password file and mail that to some at badguy.net, which is almost certainly not what this program wants. So we would call this OS command injection because the injection is happening to a uh, to a, the shell command. Uh, you know, the system is receiving a string with considerably different syntax than was expected. I picked this example because I can represent it easily in C. There are several other types of injection, such as SQL injection, which I cannot represent in standard C for one simple reason, and that is standard C does not have any database uh, library. You know, if you want to use C to connect to a database, you can, there's lots of non-portable or non-standard libraries, such as you know, SQLite's library, uh, but uh, this, but the C standard does uh, provide enough things for command injection and format string injection. But all of these problems you see are effectively a failure of validation and sanitization, uh, where the sanitization is designed to to prevent misinterpretation of the string by a subsystem like an HTML parser or a SQL parser or the system command. Uh, there are often some rather simple ways of achieving sanitization. Uh, for instance, blacklisting would simply identify characters that are considered dangerous and replace them with benign characters. If we go back to this uh, example, uh, a system that simply replaced uh, semicolons and uh, uh, pipes, for instance, would turn this uh, malicious input into nonsense. The input would not be valid, but it would also uh, not be nonsense. Everything would be passed to the mail command, and the mail command, uh, well, depending on what it does, it might just ignore everything except bogus address, adder.com. So blacklisting can work in some circumstances. The problem with blacklisting is that in order to do it correctly, you need to know all of the characters that are invalid, um, and you need to know all the details of the subsystem. You know, for instance, uh, for a Unix shell, what are all the invalid characters you would pass if you have an email address? Um, this, there's obviously the uh, the semicolon and the and the bar character. Uh, what about quotes? What about double quotes? What about percents? Um, it gets thorny and uh, you, you quickly find yourself, find yourself lost in the rabbit hole of, of the details of, you know, in this case, the Unix shell. So for that reason, we often recommend using whitelisting, which simply erases all characters except a small list of acceptable characters. Uh, this saves you from having to know details of, you know, what how is the slash treated by e the email address parser. Um, you could just simply accept a small list of acceptable characters, such as letters, uh, numbers, things like periods and, and, and uh, the at sign. So, uh, so we generally recommend whitelisting when handling sanitization. Uh, and the reason I wanted to bring up sanitization is because it is part of the problem with handling format string vulnerabilities. So formatted output functions, which are vulnerable to format string vulnerabilities, are a set of C functions. Uh, and in fact, most many newer languages, including Java and Python, support similar functions. They have printf functions. Um, in particular, C has these three functions, uh, printf, fprintf, and sprintf. In fact, you saw printf in the program that, uh, that you have been uh, exploiting and testing. So printf just simply takes uh, its arguments and prints something to standard output. Fprintf prints things to a file, and sprintf fills a buffer 
with uh, a formatted output. As you might guess, uh, since it fills a buffer, you have buffer overflow as possible when you're using sprintf. If you're using plain printf or fprintf, buffer overflow is not a problem. But format strings are a problem. So a format string is simply a character sequence that consists of mostly ordinary characters, which are printed out as they are, but the percent sign is magical. Percent is followed by another character means print up, take the next argument and do something special with it. Percent D, for instance, says, you know, take the next argument as an integer and write it out as a decimal. And percent S means take the next thing as a pointer to a string and write out that string. Uh, likewise, percent F writes a floating point number, percent P writes a pointer. And uh, there are many others, but those are the main ones that are, that are common to know. Uh, one final thing is um, uh, printf and its, and its uh, family of functions are called variadic, which means the number of arguments that are past them can vary. And that means that your compiler cannot verify that you have sent the right number of arguments. Um, the standard says if there are more arguments than conversion specifications, the extra arguments are ignored. That is, if you give it too many arguments, then the extra arguments are ignored uh, and, and nothing really bad happens. If there are not enough arguments for all the conversion specifications, the behavior is undefined. And yes, your, your <laughs> dragons be here. Uh, you know, your, your, your spider senses should be going off when you see that. So, for example, I'm showing you an example of, a, uh, of one of the first format string vulnerabilities uh, discovered in, in Wisconsin University's FTP daemon, where, uh, where the exploiters managed to send a handful of format strings, uh, of malicious format strings, to the FTP daemon, such as the one you see down here, which prints a bunch of flowing point numbers and prints a bunch of uh, plain characters. So what can you do with a format string vulnerability? How would you exploit it? And in order to answer that question, I have to dive a little bit into the uh, contents of the stack so, and how memory is laid out. So suppose you have this code, uh, this format string declared, and then a printf function, which takes the format string and three arguments. Uh, as you can see, there's the wrong number of format strings for arguments. There's four format specifiers and three arguments. So uh, as, I, as I've said, uh, the system will try and pull a fourth argument. But what is that fourth argument? So I'm going to show you the way that this memory is laid out. Uh, the system pushes onto the stack uh, the arguments. Uh, for, for Windows, uh, this was done on Windows on 32-bit. So the arguments were pushed on the stack in reverse order, and uh, the system then called printf. And so here's what memory looks like. Uh, you have first the pointer to the format string here, and then you have the three arguments, one, two, and three. And then you have some extra data, which looks rather random. It actually isn't. But what, ha what does the uh, printf function do? It has an argument pointer. Um, and uh, basically, these four these four bytes or um, sets of eight byte eight bytes in memory. Sorry, these are each four bytes. These, each of these four get a, associated with a format string, and so an argument pointer goes down, sees this first value, prints it out. Uh, the percent zero eight x is another format specifier. It simply says, use eight characters to print a hexadecimal number. Uh, leading it with zero with leading zeros if it's not big enough um, so consequently this thing will print out four uh, hexadecimal numbers and it will print these values oh oh one and then two and then three and then this thing where it scrambled the order around a bit but it happened to print uh it happened to take this data which lived on the stack and printed it as a large hexadecimal number in fact uh, if you know the uh, ASCII code sequences, you'll realize that 25 is the ASCII code sequence for percent, uh, 30 is the ASCII code sequence for 0, 38 is 8, and 78 is the lowercase x. And likewise, 2e is the period, 
And so in fact, what you're actually looking at here is the start of the format string itself. And therefore, what the output that you get, you get the part of the format string itself interpreted as a series of, as, as an integer. So we've just used the format string, uh, use a vulnerable format string to print out contents in the stack. Uh, the first three, of course, were fed in normally, but the fourth one was not. So this relates to the exercise where the exercise, and this is a little harder, but I'll give you 10 minutes again. The catch is to trick the program into printing its secret string. So if we come back to my uh, vulnerable machine. Uh, first, I'm going to I'm going to rerun this just with benign input to get rid of all that. Uh, to get rid of all these highlights there. Um, now, in particular, um, the, the thing to note is that once the uh, name is printed, well, I'll run this in the debugger so you can see what happens. Um, I'll debug, and then I will uh, we'll step along here and now I need to enter my name. I'm going to use just David, but I'm going to add a percent s to it. Now, as you can see, output has uh, not output. User has David percent s, and that winds up getting passed to output. And that, now that we send output to printf, printf receives a uh, format specifier here without actually having an argument to receive to 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 hold it. So what's it going to print? So unfortunately, if I skip, if I if I move along here, uh, I'm not going to. It's not going to actually print it. Uh, so let me run this outside the debugger so you can see what actually happens. Um, doo -doo -doo. Oops, go away, go away. All right, so we uh, we run this here, and again I will print. I'll add David percent s. So now it prints David David percent s. So let me go back in the debugger just so you can see what the see where it got that from. Uh, we'll skip through this. I should have done the debugger first, but okay. So you see it had David, but then it, but then it interpreted that percent s as printing, uh, well, printing the contents of the user string. It printed this, it printed David, and then it printed David percent s. So the challenge for this is to have the program printed secret string, which is this string that says, I've got a secret. Uh, obviously, you could just simply say, my name is, I've got a secret. And I would consider that cheating. So can you send it? A handful of uh, a handful of uh, print specifiers that cause the program to print. I've got a secret. That is the challenge of this exercise. Uh, we have just about ten minutes left, so I will. So uh, I'll let you go ahead and get started. No, so we have five minutes, but please uh, do what you can.
One minute. All right, I know we're we're a little late, so I'm gonna run through this really quickly. The way to do, um, oh, I may have to, I'll give you another minute because I may have to restart my virtual machine. Oh, no, I my machine is fine. All right, so I will run, I run the program, and the answer, the way to do this is to use 4% Ds. If you do that, then it prints four numbers, um, and then it prints, I've got a secret. This is because those four numbers uh, move the argument pointer past the uh, the string that points, that says David, and move it towards the I've got a secret string. So that the arc, once the argument pointer is on top of the string pointer, then it prints that information. So you can use format string vulnerabilities to leak sensitive information from the program. You can also use it to execute uh, malicious code as well, but uh, we're, we, we're, we're way out of time to, uh, to go into that. Uh, so that is the material of this course. The uh, summary is that uh, software is full of vulnerabilities and defects. Many of the, de the defects cause the, the vulnerabilities, but that's simply how we define them. Uh, the C and C++ programming languages have many of these defects because they assume a degree of expertise that often uh, developers really don't possess. Uh, consequently, C and C++ code is full of defects, many of which leads to vulnerabilities. And the biggest thing to watch out for is code that has vulnerabilities, even though it works as advertised when given normal input. So it's important to learn if you're, if you're writing or maintaining C code, it's important to know how the program interacts with the compiler and the platform when uh, in order to prevent defects from being exploitable vulnerabilities. Um, so if there are any questions, uh, please send them over Zoom or Slack. This is my contact info. So uh, I, will be, I will be available for about 10 more minutes here and I'll be attending a couple of more tracks. I will recommend using my email address uh, as the most surefire way to reach me. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you, David.